garden, the Baxter Bar Park project, it sort of, um, it had its beginnings actually in the records that we had in the University Archive, and um, particularly the records of the trustees of Baxter Park, that when you read the minutes here, you find out who was using the park, um, what was happening in the park, things like bylaws, um, what they could and couldn't do in the park. And that was sort of interesting in itself, but then we realised, well, actually, we could do more than just sort of look through one set of minute books. And we approached Morgan Academy, and Annabel Quinn, who's the history head of history there, was really keen to sort of get her um, you know, three children involved, pupils involved. And so we put together um, a project which meant that we, the children weren't just using the records that we had about Baxter Park but also the records that were held in Dundee City Archive and also the records that were held in um, the local studies section at the Wellgate Library, um, the central library in the Wellgate. Basically it was a sort of a, a heritage wide community project. What we wanted them to do was to look at Baxter Park, which is literally just across the road from their school, which they use all the time, even if it's just going backwards and forwards to school, or sort of chatting to their friends on the swings, or bouncing a few balls at the basketball area down at the bottom there. Wanted them to sort of see this green space, this Baxter Park area, in a, in a bit of a new light, to under, a better understanding hence the use of the archives to find out why there was a park built, who built it, what was it built for, using the minute books to find out who used it over the years, how it developed, how it changed. So it was a good project for them to understand how historical records relate to their present, relate to their lives. And also, um, to understand not just about the development of the park itself but to use the records to look behind that. So they examined uh, David Baxter, why he started, why he funded the park. It was because of the poor health and working conditions of his workers. So they looked into things like the um, Dundee Social Union report on housing and industrial conditions in the city they looked at how people lived, how these people lived, that prompted them, prompted the likes of David Baxter to produce this sort of green, healthier area for them, um, to examine what, what it was, what it gave these people, and actually what it still gives as a green space to the people of Dundee today. And so we put all this research together into stories and we put it on the Big Back Garden website. The narratives were recorded by um, some of the pupils and they are now available. Um, you can go around some of the benches in Baxter Park and scan the QR code plaques that are fixed to some of the benches and um, listen to the narratives. The whole point of the park being built was to provide a green and healthy space for uh, away from the poor living conditions and the crowded living conditions unhealthy working conditions of the people of Dundee um, and although Dundee as a city is very different to what it was in the 19th century industrialization it still offers that green space but we don't have the skills to understand how that works and but Christine and Susan do and they've got long experience so we approached them and said would they like to be involved and thankfully they said yes um, so it's great because um, the, the pupils not only understand the history and the why of the park but understand the why of what it is now in their lives um, and that's thanks to Susan and Christine's research.
when we think about Baxter Park, it's important to also reflect on how the park actually came to be. And one of the interesting things about this project is that we started out trying to understand people's connections to the area and their use of green space more generally and thinking about current events. And as we got involved in the project more and more, we realised that there was other aspects to the history of the park that was really important to reflect on. And one of the aspects of this is how there came to be resources to actually establish the park in the first place. And when we look at the wider context to the Baxter family wealth, if we look further back in the earlier period before the park, we see that uh, the family established the wealth through their involvement in the linen trade in particular. Now, when we follow some of that, we can see that, uh, for instance, the jute and some of the coarser materials were sometimes used uh, in trade for clothing in particular, and this was often sent to the Caribbean and other parts of the Americas for clothing people who were enslaved and working on plantations. So then there becomes a bit more of a complex history. So even though we're looking at this period a bit later, if you look at the connections to the land and how that varies depending on where you are, then it is a bit more complicated. And one of the things we wanted to recognise here is that that legacy of colonialism in many ways has also enabled us today to benefit from this green space and that's something that we've been exploring in more detail looking at Dundee's connections to the slave trade and whether that is directly or indirectly and this is something also that's of relevance to Baxter Park and in the university we've been exploring that in relation to the Founders Project so we wanted to mention that because these are something that might appear when we're doing a project on the current landscape where actually there's another important historical connection that we might not have been aware of at first glance. And that's something that we are going to explore and uh, reflect on in further activities related to the Big Back Garden. And so now what we will do though is, is turn to that landscape and try and get a sense of how people connect to it today. Hello and welcome to the Big Back Garden Project. My name is Susan Mains and I'm a lecturer in Human Geography at the University of Dundee. And I'm Christine Kingsley and I'm a lecturer in Design at the University of Dundee at the Art College, Duncan Jordanson College of Art and Design. And we're here today to introduce you to our project and this is a short film to hopefully give you a sense of how we relate to green spaces and in particular this very special space Baxter Park in Dundee and we came to do some work on this partly talking to Jan Merchant in the University Archives who is very much involved in putting together a historical project that's an ongoing project that we've been collaborating with looking at the history of Baxter Park and the various activities that have been going on and also connecting with local schools and different organisations to look at how the use of the park has changed over time but also how it forms an important place for a sense of community and this ties into how we understand our connections to place in particular for instance what is it that draws us to a place what is it that makes it feel enjoyable or welcoming and in particular, what role does green spaces play? And uh, particularly when we're thinking about connections to nature, places that give us an opportunity to reflect, to really just to breathe. And in many ways, what we might think about in terms of having a sense of perspective. And we feel that this park offers us an opportunity to explore that and to think about how parks form a really vital function of creating a sense of place and also encouraging us to take part in lots of other activities that we may not otherwise have the opportunity to do when we live in a built-up environment. 
So we're here today sheltering under this beautiful tree. It's a very rainy day, but the park's still full, isn't it, Susan, with people wandering around about. Uh, and we were really one of the wonderful things about this park is is the variety of people who are in it. So we're using a method that empathises with people called AEIOU. Uh, and that methodology is how we put this film together with Julie Cummings' help. Who, uh, and really it's about capturing all those different ways of how people have used the park. I used to be an apprentice gardener back in Baxter Park in 1980. I've always worked in the East End, so Baxter Park has been a prominent place of work for me during my 42 years with the council. There was four years of apprentices, from first year up to fourth year. Every year had a different day to come to the park. Therefore, the training officer, that was his building down in the bottom corner. That was our training office. And he had different duties for different days. The amount of changes that have went in the park through green space, through biodiversity, from back then to now is incredible. The change is incredible, really. The flower beds sitting behind us just now they used to be rose beds and there was a, a stunning rose garden back in the day and obviously that was part of your training to keep the roses, yeah. prune them, maintain them, edge them, cut the grass. So it's still the same shape but the beds are completely different from back in the 1980s. the summer into autumn's favourite time for the parks. Mm. There's more more in the park in the summer, there's more colour, a lot of the trees lose their leaves. Autumn's a very good time in the park mm. for the trees, the different colours just before the leaves shed. Parks are different things for everybody. As you say, you want a quiet moment, you go into the long areas where you can sit under the trees and Nah, but if you want to go run about and play football, the, the area is there for you. But sometimes it's just good to sit on a bench and see both sides. More people are getting active and the park is a very good place to do it. It's a safe environment, there's no traffic. Before, it just used to be a, a, grass, a big grassy area where the people come and play. But now we actually see people exercising. They have fun runs in the park every Sunday morning for the kids. There's more activities, there's more sport. I said they've done away with the bowling green, but they've put a mugger court down there and the tennis courts. These things were never here back in the day. We try to evolve the park with the times. And we say biodiversity, we're trying to do that. We're putting exercise machines in the park for people that want to come out and do a bit of walking. It's there to benefit everybody who want to be benefited by. So I worked um, in Stobswell with the UNESCO City Design Team um, to look at two pocket park areas and it was funded via Sustrans Scotland and we were involved in some co-design workshops run by the Service Design Academy and we identified that they wanted more colour and nature into the area and so I was brought in to do a kind of visual identity to help bring a lot of colour into some pocket parks. Um, so my job was to go about and find bits of inspiration in the area 
and there was so much because there was lots of talks in the consultation about all the jewels of Strobswell, they're talking about the Morgan, the beautiful railings, sort of the Baxter Park and all the green spaces and the Stobbs Muir ponds. So you'll see a lot of bits of Baxter Park in my colourful crossing. Um, I use the Baxter Park railings, some of the nice kind of ornate shapes in the railings. Yeah. So I've got a background in printed textiles and I'm always looking for sort of shapes and patterns and seeing that repetition. I don't know, like, there's something just so grand about looking at the pavilion and looking back at all the trees, but then recently I've liked the the monkey puzzle tree, there's a monkey puzzle tree there and I just, you know, I've always loved monkey puzzle trees so um, I think to do that, something with that someday maybe. I'm the happiest amongst green spaces, I spent lots of time as a teenager in that, that space. Um, it's definitely, it has changed now, it seems it's, it's improved loads of the pavilion, it's, uh, it's beautiful now, it was not so grand back when I was a teenager. You know, I don't know, my body tries to aim towards nature and you know, finding green spaces within a kind of urban space and it's that kind of natural um, movement of the leaves and the rustling and all the things that um, come with nature kind of it resets your body I think. I have my dog it's his favorite place in the world we could walk him in the woods we could walk him at the beach but no he just wants to come to the park as soon as we come out of the flat he just pulls and pulls and pulls in the direction of the park there's like a wee crew of people that live around here and you know everyone that lives around here and you know all the dogs because you pass the same people every day and always at the same time so there was one time that he didn't like a dog for some reason they just didn't like each other so both of us kind of had this mutual agreement that we would walk loops in the opposite direction every single day so that they didn't see each other. When we lived on the other side of the park before we moved to this side so literally directly opposite um, we kind of used to come here but that was just because it was in lockdown and we didn't have a garden so like the only green space that we had access to was the park so I used to come and sit and read my book and I used to cycle around it and stuff, but I was never in it anywhere near as much until I got the dog. Because I don't have a garden, so it's an, it's all like it's a necessity. It was a necessity in lockdown to keep me sane, and now it's a necessity to walk my dog. Like it's kind of got the same importance because I need somewhere, and this is the place that's right on my doorstep. Do you notice in your education is there importance in green spaces in the city? I guess a lot of them are probably in the same situation as me, as in a lot of them live in flats. So the catchment area that I've got is kind of like Dens Road, there's Lochy, so most of them live in flats. Like I always hear them chatting on like Friday night, oh we're going to go down in the park or we're going to go hang out here or there, normally outside because they don't have the gardens that they can sit in and chill with their friends yeah. so they're probably much similar to me as in it's just a reason for them to get out because we did a project and it was what does the city centre mean to you and they basically went oh I don't go there because there's nothing for me whereas they kind of seem to stick around their local areas and hang out at their local parks rather than like going into town and hanging about there. Um, so yeah we used to live on the other side of the park and then we saw that one come for sale and we were like oh like let's just go look at it but we turned up and it was like it's on a really busy road and we get to it and it's like a typical tenement and me and my partner were kind of looking at each other like oh maybe this is not great and then we're right at the top so we get right to the top and then we walk in and we walk into the living room and it's like a big classic Victorian like huge bay window and all you can see out that window is just the entire park and we just looked at each other and we were like yes this one is for us because even though we're on the really busy road and we're pretty central like the only thing we can see from our windows is the park
and we didn't even have a sofa or a TV for ages. So we just used to have our two like little camp chairs facing the window, and we just used to sit out and look at the park. It's just really nice because normally when you're in a flat in a city, you're looking into other flats or you're looking out on grey or like you can very much tell you're in the city whereas we were willing to overlook the road because you just can't tell when you're in the flat because all you can see is green, all you can see is the park, so it's brilliant.